Uh, my name is James Buckley, and I was in the class of 1940. Do you have any recollections of Mr. Poling? Did you have him as a teacher? No, I did not have him as a teacher, but he was an authority figure. We all knew that he charmed our parents, but on campus he was a stern. He uh, sometimes had a twinkle in his eye, but uh, there was no uh, <coughs> contradicting his authority or underestimating it. He was also capable of, of um, educational pranks, and maybe prank is the wrong word. But he, uh, one example was when a boy came to him and said, Mr. Pulling, can I do that? And Mr. Pulling said, yes, you can. Uh, the boy proceeded to do that, and then he was placed on detention be because he could do it, but he might not do it. And so from the generations of Milbrook people thereafter knew the distinction between may and can. How about Mrs. Pulling? She was warm, friendly, and uh, uh, we all, all liked her tremendously. Did she start the tradition of uh, doing the boys' birthday parties when you were a student? Well, I don't know if she started it when I was there, but it was, yes, she, I, mm -hmm. it was a big event every year. The and, great and problem was them. deciding which of our two classmates we would choose uh, for the privilege of joining us. What other uses were there for Pulling House, for the Headmaster's House, when, when you were a student? You the, the one, uh, in fact, the only one that comes to mind is the uh, annual reading by Mr. Pulling of the Christmas Carol. That was wonderful. He had a wonderful way of projecting the characters. And, uh, well, the one that I remember most clearly and had, I guess, the greatest influence on me is uh, uh, Frank Trevor. He and, arri and I arrived the same year. He with uh, Boa Constrictor and uh, Sparrowhawk, and I with two armadillos. And so that made us fast friends. And uh, I had uh, advanced biology under him. I had a sort of, obviously I came here with an interest particularly in birds and that was his particular interest. So I was in the original zoo squad and uh, engaged in the bird banding and all the rest of it. So he's had a very strong influence on me and incidentally advanced biology was uh, more sophisticated than any biology course available to Yale undergraduates when I went to Yale. I, I mean that seriously, very seriously. Then uh, Mr. Callan, uh, who's assistant uh, headmaster, a wonderfully warm and understanding man. And if everyone had troubles and problems, he's the person we'd, we'd go vi visit, at least I would go visit. Another man who had a great influence was uh, Nat Abbott, who uh, I got off on bad terms because he, he was a, a Latin teacher who constructed at great trouble a miniature Roman bridge, which my arm armadillo proceeded to, <laughs> to destroy. <coughs> but uh, Mr. Abbott uh, was a great musician, and uh, he ran the glee club and so on. I participated in that. And then Milbrook became the, one of the early participants in a course in music uh, sponsored by the Carnegie Foundation. And this gave me a, a, an exposure to classical music, courtesy of uh, Nat Abbott and that program that has lasted me the rest of my life. Uh, my community service uh, assignment was the zoo, so I was in the original zoo squad, and that occupied my time and interest uh, throughout my remaining years at Millbrook. Can you describe the zoo of the late 30s? Uh, what what buildings and what animals? Well, and there was sources? one building during my entire existence here. Uh, and we had a couple of out outdoor cages. We had uh, uh, a couple of uh, red-tailed hawks and crows, uh, a great horned owl. We had a fox. Uh, let's see, what else? A kinkajou. Uh, odds and ends of birds and, and animals, uh, and 
And your armadillos. Well, they they expired rather early on. I'm sorry to say. Well, they're not northeastern animals. No, no, they're not. <laughs> did they live at the zoo or in your? How did they, they lived in the basement the in the basement of the dining hall building. Uh, well, that was that? before the zoo was built. Oh. Yes. So were you one of the students who participated in building that one zoo building? Yes. Oh, yes. We dug the foundations, poured the cement, and the whole works. I, sh I should have mentioned uh, right there in my top list was Arthur Tuttle. Now, if you had any aptitude f f for math, he, it w he was a wonderful teacher. If you had no aptitude, you, you didn't like the man at all. But he, he had all kinds of uh, games that he would uh, play that, that enabled you to use your own initiatives to try to solve this problem or that problem. And uh, I thought it was an effective way to, uh, to teach. And anyway, I, I enjoyed him thoroughly. Uh, given my particular interest, uh, I'd go on bird walks and things of that sort, and the fields around uh, Millbrook were great. And uh, we happened to be in the right flight path, so we got a great variety of warblers and vireos and things of that sort. Uh, we still do bird banding. Right. It's still right. going strong. It's yeah. never, it's never, uh, never ended. That's right. one of our oldest community yeah. services, right. which is yeah. great. I was there with the initiation of the bird banding. Yes. Now, I, my experience in Millbrook was not totally uh, typical in that uh, when my father was looking around for schooling, and I'm the, f the second of th uh, four brothers, and Millbrook had just started up in the Depression, and so my father had great bargaining power. He had four sons in inventory when talking to Mr. Pulling, and he negotiated a deal whereby uh, we would go back to Sharon, 11 miles away, uh, after classes on Friday, come back Monday morning, go back Wednesday afternoons after classes, and come back Thursday morning. So we had the taste, uh, we had the boarding experience, but we also had a little more freedom. And so you talk, what did I do for fun? Well, I had a lot of fun on weekends <laughs> and a lot of fun Wednesday afternoons. My first taste of Millbrook School was an unusual one in that I arrived here for, for the last month of second form year. Why? Because there was a fire in our house in Sharon and suddenly uh, there were uh, eight or nine refugees that had to be housed and as my older brother was here, uh, Mr. Uh, and I was destined to come here in any event the following year, uh, Mr. Pulling has accepted me. In those days, uh, the first and second forms lived in basically dormitories with the beds separated by curtains. And uh, I suspect a lot of things were thrown over the barriers from one cubicle to another, but I don't remember those details. But uh, there was always building going on during my, uh, my four years at Millbrook. Uh, <coughs> I guess the dining room building had just been completed. Uh, then another dormitory building was built. I guess we called it the new dorm. Uh, I guess an alumni, a sort of a guest house for alumni was built, and that's where I had a room f in my senior year. Uh, there was no chapel. Uh, and, the, and the, the barn was where all our classes took place and most of the extracurricular activities. So you had the, the, the barn was used for the theater and the gym and the... And, and classrooms, except the science classes were in the basement of the dining room. And the other building that was built in my tenure, of course, was, was a zoo. And I had... Uh, a part of, as a manual laborer, unpaid manual laborer in, in, in building it. Well, besides uh, my it's the immersion in natural history, I think that the, my greatest uh, legacy, if you will, from, uh, the, from Millbrook experience is the appreciation for classical music. 
Well, I started out <coughs> to be a country lawyer. I just loved living in the country. Uh, I wanted to avoid New York City and uh, urban life. Uh, I've, after the war, I was in the Navy during the war. And uh, <coughs> I came back, went to Yale Law School, then uh, uh, spent four years with a New Haven firm, uh, 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 law firm learning the trade. But somehow or other, I got intercepted by uh, my older brother, who was then working for a family business based in New York. And so I found myself against all of my plannings, uh, plans to be in New York. Work, and I worked the following s 17 years, uh, part law and part executive in a company giving advice uh, to a, a group of uh, companies engaged in oil and gas exploration overseas. Then my exotic uh, younger brother, Bill, decided he, to run for mayor of New York uh, just to find out what urban problems were all about. And he want, asked me to be his campaign manager, uh, to act as kind of a buffer with the eager uh, politicians of the New York's Conservative Party. Uh, that called my existence to the attention to the fathers of the Conservative Party who began running out of candidates they had to run. And so two, three years later in 1968, while in Libya, I received a telephone call saying, would I like to run for the United States Senate? I said, that's an absurd idea. Then it was explained to me that as I couldn't win, I didn't have to work very hard at it. So uh, I decided, well, this would be an interesting experience. And so I became a candidate to run for the United States Senate in 1968. Uh, Jacob Javits was a Republican uh, whom the Conservative Party could not possibly endorse because he was a very, very liberal uh, senator. And I, I did surprisingly well. I got, about, I think, a million votes. And then uh, that was the beginning of all the turmoil involving Vietnam. And uh, <clears throat> I did a lot of traveling overseas in places like the Philippines and Australia. And uh, I saw the headlines and the student uh, the bombings and, uh, and burning of flags and so on. And then the a Boy Scout impulse took over and I said, well, what the devil? Maybe I can run and get elected. Uh, so I came back, and I was a candidate again in a three-party, again in a three-party race in 1970, and I managed to win with 40 percent of the vote. So I, so I became an accidental senator. Uh, I tried to get re-elected, but uh, Daniel Patrick Moynihan uh, seemed to have a, a larger appeal than I did in a two-way race. And uh, then three years later, uh, excuse me, four years later, when uh, Ronald Reagan uh, became <coughs> became elected uh, president, uh, I was offered a position as an undersecretary of state, uh, which I accepted. And so I spent uh, a couple of years in the State Department, and then I became president of Radio Free Europe, Radio Liberty took me to Munich. Uh, those stations broadcast uh, to the uh, Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc, the Soviet Bloc. Um, and then when I came, I received a telephone call in Munich saying, would you like to be a federal judge? And I said, this is an outrageously stupid idea. But then I asked a lot of, you know, I wanted to find out more about it. I talked to a lot of people and I found it could be challenging and interesting and so I found myself as <coughs> on the United States Court of Appeals for the District of Columbia Circuit where I spent uh, the remaining 15 years of my working life. As Mr. Pulling believed that everyone should learn how to ex express himself and uh, so uh, the dreaded uh, exercise every spring was the necessity to a write a, a speech on a subject of your choice and be deliver it to the entire school. It was done in the dining room 
And uh, I said it was a dread experience, at least for me. I hated it. I don't think I did it at all well. And uh, when I left Millbrook, that was the last time I gave a speech until suddenly I found myself in the position of being a candidate for the August position of United States Senator. And you can't run for political office without giving speeches. But I, I never achieved the ability to, to do it impromptu. Uh, <laughs> impromptu. So, uh, but I lost, I mean, eventually you lose your state fright, but the first t two or three times I had to speak in public, I'd race through it about 90 miles an hour, but I finally learned how to slow down. Obviously, it's a totally different institution from when, when I, I remember it. I, I loved Millbrook when I was here. It was small, intimate, uh, and, but it's kept on growing and growing and growing. And uh, I've spent, I forget how many years as a trustee of the school in the, uh, in the 70s, late, I think probably the late 70s, early 80s. And so the, the totally different kinds of problems that it faced, it had some crises. Uh, it came close to a bankruptcy at one point. Uh, and, and one approach to it at the time when I was a uh, trustee was, let's lower our standards a bit and you know bring in students. Uh, and that was almost the death of Millbrook. You can't compromise standards. And I think and that's a lesson that uh, Millbrook has learned and hasn't had to learn over again, thank, thank, thank the Lord. I, I did see and uh, had some contact with the pullings uh, in, in, in the late 70s and early 80s and uh, found out what a totally agreeable person Mr. Pulling really is. <laughs> Really was. No, he was a fine, fine man, and, and she was always a fine woman, yeah. But uh, the, uh, the Lord, the mayor of Lithgow and his consort and the Twilight League, that was a great experience. That wonderful springtime when things get warm and you sort of feel lazy and relaxed, start getting spring fever, and that was great. And he always put on a, a wonderful show. Another thing that used to happen in those days, and I don't know if it still does, but the, the Millbrook Hunt would meet at Millbrook uh, school, at the school one morning every spring. And that was great to see people in their red coats and the hounds and the rest, and they'd go racing off somewhere. Yeah.